um, I noticed I've got 280, we're actually, I think it's more like 400,000 now, so um, these slides get updated. I, I should apologise for, the, these slides are actually um, quite marketing heavy, so they're bastardised from a, a talk that I'm giving next week to a slightly different crowd, I imagine, so um, if you have any technical questions, feel free to ask me, ask me later how it all works and I can, um, I can give you a bit more info, so, right, let's get through this. So, a bit of background, really. Um, I work for a company called TTP, who may be known as the Technology Partnership, depending on how uh, Vogue letters are versus words. Um, we're one of the consultancies based in Cambridge, so we're about 350 people now, so reasonably sized, um, based out in Melbourne. Um, and we basically do product and technology development for other companies. So, um, some of the variety of things that we do in our group. I, I should say I, I'm an electronics engineer by background. Um, I mainly sort of do business development work these days in um, sort of connected systems, but the street lighting stuff we come on to in a bit is uh, what I've spent the last two years of my life doing, so I'm pretty familiar, if not sick, of uh, working on street lights. Anyway, this is, uh, this is um, I think if you, if you came along last month, I think it was, there was a talk by one of the guys from GEO, um, Home Energy Monitors. It's a good example of a a client that we work with, um, not not that recently. I mean, we we did projects six or seven years ago for them, um, but that's a classic example of the kind of projects that we work on. Dymo, beer dispensers. Th this is medical diagnostics. That's pretty big for us now. We do a lot of medical products of various sorts. But anyway, that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, th these are the kind of products that we um, we work on. This is uh, this actually is kind of interesting because this is home automation. Um, again, this is a this is a geo product. This is actually a a bridge. So this talks Sigby and um, a proprietary 868 meg indoor radio um, protocol that we put together for these guys. Um, this was kind of before before the Internet of Things was a bit of a hype. Um, we were still still talking connected systems, almost machine to machine then. Um, so we were we were there before it got got hypey. Um, this is int this I reckon is probably one of the world's largest rollouts actually of um, connected devices. Uh, these are shelf edge labels, so they replace um, your printed labels in supermarkets. Um, they're, they're effectively e-ink, so what you have on a Kindle. There's kind of technology of displays. There's a radio behind it. Um, what they do is you you install them in a store and they connect to the back office database, so the prices are always in sync. Um, the beauty of it is, well, the store saves money because they don't have to print the labels anymore. Um, the other thing is you can run sort of uh, effectively special offers. So, you know, Friday afternoon you can drop the price of X, Y, and Z, or deli counters as cheese is going out of date, you can drop the price. But there's, there's about 8 million of these things installed now, not, not, in, not in the UK, but in, in mainland Europe. So, um, another interesting IoT app. This, this is IoT and big data. So full of all the buzzwords. This is uh, monitoring cows, so um, the health of dairy cattle. So they actually, um, it's quite, this is, so you can see how big it is. This is a, it's got a bolus gun, so it actually forces the sensor past their gag reflex, so the poor cows swallow these things. Um, and it, it sits in there, the big stomach, so it sits in the room just about here. And they wear other sensors, they have a collar there, various sensors around their body. Um, and you can build up a model of what a, what a healthy cow looks like and then you can tell the farmer whether the cow's poorly or not so it's all about maximizing um, milk production anyway slight diversion gives you kind of a bit of a background of the kind of things that we uh, we work on um, street lighting not not an obvious application for for internet of things but um, surprisingly there does seem to be a lot of cash in it um, th this kind of gives you an idea of the size of the market actually I, th this is a this is a slide aimed at the US presentation so that's why it's got US numbers on. Um, the UK has about six six million streetlights I think so there's quite, there's quite a few. Um, the US actually is interesting they they're not entirely sure how many they have. Um, somewhere between 50 and 100 million they're not entirely sure how you can be that wrong I'm not in, I really don't know but um, so 100 terawatts of electricity that's used by the, the street lighting <coughs> in the US. Um, it's a big number it's it's about equivalent to two million U.S. households. So obviously, if you can, if you can do something to cut that in half, um, that's a big saving in electricity, and quite an easy, an easy saving actually. So streetlights. Um, this is a 
a photodiode. Um, th this is this is effectively how streetlights used to be switched, or for the last, I guess, 30 or 40 years. You you can often often see them top of streetlights. It looks like a little plastic dome. It's got one of these or a variant of it. It just detects the light level, and then at around sort of 35 lux, which actually is quite quite a small amount of light. Um, the light switch off, switch on. Um, in the UK, there's a slightly weird charging mechanism for this, where the local authorities get charged um, by the electricity companies based on a weird set of rules about how long the lights are on and off. So we'll come to why that's important in a bit. Um, what we've effectively done is is this network street lights. So you replace the photo cell with uh, with a little node. So it goes in the, the same socket on the top. Um, you form a big big mesh network of street lights. Um, this thing's a coordinator. You put a radio modem in it, and it, it talks back into the cloud. Um, and then you can do a, a variety of, uh, of interesting things. Um, someone probably will ask me why we use Zigbee. Um, like, it's an interesting choice. The decision was made before we were involved, so we can kind of blame it on the, the previous guys. But actually, it's not a, it's not a crazy idea for some, some, some bits and pieces I'll come to in a bit. Um, this is what the hardware, hardware actually looks like. So this thing is your, this is your coordinator. So this controls the network of streetlights. Um, so it's got GSM, so it's 3G, so it's a 4G modem in it. Um, it's also got light sensors. So important to note, these, these things don't have light sensors in them anymore. Um, <coughs> so they're all switched off this central coordinator. And then what you do is you have one of these that I can't reach at the top on every single streetlight. Um, What's interesting, uh, th th this node is effectively not involved in driving the actual streetlight itself. So inside the streetlight in here, there'll be something that's either called a ballast or an LED or a driver, depending on whether you've got LED or, or SON is the, is the sodium technology that a lot of the, these things use. And there's, a, there's effectively a digital comms interface between this widget and the, the driver inside, which enables you to do things like dimming. Um, the Daily Mail runs occasional stories about people being slightly concerned about streetlights being turned off, you know, people getting feeling unsafe, but actually I think it turns out that people don't tend to notice, so if you dim streetlights, people don't really realise. Um, <coughs> so some of these systems, what they do is they set it up so three in the morning, you know, they cut the light level down by 50% because of course not many people are around with obvious, obvious energy savings. <laughs> so I forgot to bring one along actually so people can look at these, but this, this is what sits inside them. Um, the power supply, the radio, um, the relay allows you to cut the power off completely to the lamp, which is actually quite important because this thing draws much less power in its standby state than the um, the ballast usually does inside the lamp, so it, it allows you to drop the um, drop the power consumption right down. This um, the arm guys would be pleased to know has got an arm core inside it, which is very relevant for Cambridge. Um, also does this, this is interesting. It's not it's not used much, but metering. Um, so the way the way these things are metered at the moment, um, there's effectively a, a government body that works out roughly how much these streetlights take when they're on, um, and then it also works when dawn and dusk times are, and that's how much you get charged for. Um, actually, that tends to probably be pessimistic, optimistic, depending whether you're the council or the um, electricity company. But generally, they're charged for more than they actually use. What what this allows you to do is the meter how much power is actually being used by every single streetlight and being charged charged accordingly. But the other, the main thing actually this is used for at the moment is that we can work out whether the streetlight is working or not, um, which again is very important as we come to that. The other nice thing about this system is it's compatible with the socket that the uh, photo cell sits in. So when people install these systems they can they can roll them out with photo cells to start with and then they can swap it over with the um, the network management system um, a bit later, as and when, when funds allow. There's also also an internal system, an internal node. So this is effectively the same thing as the um, the thing that we saw on the top of the street light, but this is a this is a sign. So effectively a, a speed you know, speed sign, things like that. This is a traffic bollard. So one of the vertical things that you see you see sticking up, um, and then. So our responsibility is the hardware and all the software right up into the cloud. Um, the client did this bit, um, which is, they have a very nice user interface, front end. Um, 
won't run on my uh, my tablet, unfortunately, but it's quite an interesting one. So this is what the effectively either the local authorities or the guys who are maintaining the streetlights um, see. So why why do people install these? The metering, so you only get charged what you use. Fault management. This is this is actually surprisingly important. Um, so in the UK, um, if you look at some of the big councils, they effectively during the winter they visually inspect every single street light about every two weeks to see whether they're working or not. Um, you've got five, you know, five six million street lights in the UK. That's a hell of a lot of people driving around in circles just checking to see whether the street lights are working or not. Um, if you can change that around so the street light knows when it's gone faulty, it makes it much easier because you can just dispatch the guy out to the the actual street light that's gone wrong to fix it. Um, and then dimming. I mean, obviously it's going to save power, but that's one of the other big reasons these are installed. It gives you a lot of um, dynamic control over whether you can you can bring the lights up when there's people around, all this all this kind of stuff, or you can just simply dim it at uh, three in the morning, for example, which is fairly common. Um, and there's one one other big saving that is applicable to LED street lights in particular. Um, the way LED street lights are designed is that when they're mm. when they're at end of life say so down this end, they actually give 100% of their design output, so in terms of brightness. <coughs> um, so what they effectively do is when they're brand new, they give you sort of 130%. So actually what you can do is you dim it when it's brand new to 70, and then gradually turn it up over the lifetime of the lamp. So that kind of maintains a, a constant brightness level. And then, of course, you, you save this, which can add up to be something fairly significant. Um, so, um, the installs that these have been taking place in th th this is a this is a PFI, so it's a public-private finance initiative. You know how it seems to be in vogue at the moment, but it's a way for councils to effectively afford to get their lighting stock installed. So a company will come along and effectively loan them loan them the money to do the um, to do the install. So the biggest one where this system has been installed is the what's called the South Coast PFI, it's actually Hampshire. So everyone should, this is of course aimed at Americans who would no idea where, where I'd be talking about. So down on the South Coast, the client's actually based in Southampton, which I think is partially why they probably won this contract. Um, so there's 155,000 streetlights in, uh, in that particular area. So it's quite a, you know, quite a significant number. Um, so the work began in April 2010, so it's a 25 year contract. So w the mechanism for this is um, a company down there called SSEC, so, or SSE Lighting now, effectively have the maintenance contract for Hampshire to look after their street lights. They install these management systems and it significantly <coughs> simplifies their, the, the, the process that they're going through. Um, but it's quite, the, the nice thing about these, these rollouts is they effectively pay for themselves very quickly, actually, so it's quite a, it's just a, a nice real-world application of connected devices because there's a genuine saving here, um, and some of the savings are quite, quite large. Um, th this is a slightly artificial saving because this is a carbon tax that the government Im imposes on local authorities, so they're actually saving the fact that they might have to pay this in the future, if that makes sense. Um, if, a if a council doesn't roll this kind of system out, then they're going to be st stuck with these kind of, um, kind of bills in the future. So this is Southampton. Quite like this slide. It gives you an idea of 155,000. It's quite a big number, actually. So this is just this. This is central Southampton, basically, and every single one of these little dots is a streetlight with one of these nodes sat on top. Um, different colours. So these are the different networks around each of the coordinators, and you won't be able to see it, but in the centre of oh, well, there's one actually. The, these are the coordinators. So that's the coordinator for that that little bit of the network. Um, so we get about 500, 500 or so nodes off each, um, <coughs> off each central coordinator, so the node is the bit that's designed to be cheap. The coordinator has all, a lot more of the intelligence in it. <coughs> and as I was saying, what, what, the, what they've actually installed, or what the, the features they've implemented down there is, the, this, this is one of the big things that gives them the savings, the, um, is the dimming. So from midnight to 5am they, they turn the lights down by 50%. Now that uh, that's just perhaps a little bit, it, even though the lights have been turned down to their 50% level, actually perceived light levels are a lot higher than that, so it doesn't look like it's 50%. It's just that's actually the, um, the power saving. 
Um, but then perhaps, perhaps more interestingly, um, and I think that, that, that this is the fascinating thing about this, is once you've got these systems in place, what you've actually got is a coverage of an entire city or geographical area with a, effectively a low power, low data weight, right, but low power comms network. So in smart city applications, which is a, another one of those hypey words, um, really the only way at the moment, if you want to get data back to servers or, or cloud or whatever, you, you have to use 3G, so you have to put a GSM modem mm -hmm. in it, um, or, or Wi-Fi, but uh, that's a whole other complicated uh, issue to get around. But you put a 3G modem in it, expensive, got to put a SIM card in it, so you've got a £5 a month charge for each device. Um, takes a lot of power. It's just not really compatible with a series, a very large number of low cost um, sensors spread across. So say, this a good example is say you wanted to measure the temperature of the surface of every street in a city so you can look to see whether you need to grit, you know, whether you need to grit it or not. Realistically, you're not going to be able to afford to put a 3G modem with a little temperature sensor and a big battery um, on every road. Something like this however, would allow you to do that. So what, what we're actually working on at the moment is effectively, not every street light, but a strategically large number of them. We enable them, so we open up another network. Um, and then this effectively acts as a, I guess, a transport, transparent transport layer back up to other people's, um, other people's applications. What's nice about this is this, um, this bit of the infrastructure is effectively funded by the rollout of the street lighting, so you don't actually have to um, invest a significant amount of money um, in doing it. Th this is quite a hot topic at the moment because um, there's some very big EU projects around this kind of thing, and um, a lot of the smart cities like Bristol is quite ahead of the game on this. They, they had a large amount of money to roll out a smart city network, but they've actually gone for very high bandwidth. So they, they, they have about 74 street lights throughout the city that they've put fibre to. Um, which is fine, but there's there's a bit of a confusion as to what you can actually use that for because you just don't need that kind of bandwidth. Um, what this allows you to do is to infill those spaces with a with effectively a low power, low bandwidth network, um, which I think works really well. So there we are, done, almost on time. Um, and a bit of uh, we, we're actually recruiting quite heavily, so. Um, if anyone wants to come along to a recruitment evening, uh, let me know. Um, no contact details. Oh, there we are. Um, just drop me an email because we, we've got an open day and we're looking for software engineers, mechanical, electronics, um, pretty much everyone you can think of because uh, we're, we're desperate for good engineers at the moment. So um, please drop me a line and I'll, I'll introduce you to our HR department. Done. Take a few questions while um, while Ben gets set up. Yeah. Any anyone any burning questions? Yeah. How does the security work when you're opening up access to other devices? No, it's a good question. I mean, that's why we've kind of been hesitant to do it at the moment because um, obviously we don't want to give people away access to the. The, the network that we use for lighting. The, the hardware we've got actually is capable of running two separate networks. So what we can do is we can run effectively individual Zigbee networks that are then firewalled at the node back onto the, the main network. So that's that's how we're going to get around that, we think. But it's a, it is a concern. Um, the, the Zigbee bit itself, the, the transport bit is quite secure. We're, we're pretty happy with that. But it, that's why we haven't opened it up to third parties yet, because, you know, that does open some... Yeah, worries. I guess. Charge for Say again. Charge for um, I'll, honestly, I don't know. Um, you know, we're not the client, so we don't we don't run it. I I would have thought there would have to be some kind of financial, you know, because Mayflower in this case, SSE, they run the network, so it's costing them. So they would expect <laughs> to have some kind of payback for that. And I think it's important that this wouldn't be opened up to everybody you know I just that's n that's not going to work just because of the inherent limitations and the amount of bandwidth we have available here so I think it would be a case of opening it up to validated third parties who have a legitimate you know like parking or refuse and things like that some sort of password to get into 
Yeah, or a network. I, I, you know, how that exactly would, would work, we're not quite sure yet, but there's got to be a mechanism to make it work. Okay, so latencies, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, we see about, it's, it's sort of 20 to 25 milliseconds a hop if you're sending data from a node back. Um, it, it, we've architectured it so that um, latency isn't important, I guess. Um, it's, a, a lot of it's done in the outbound, it's done through broadcasts. Um, and then the nodes, when they send the data back, that it's it's heavily randomised because we have such a large amount of nodes sat on this Zigbee network. Um, when we've measured the latency, it, it sort of hovers around that 20 to 25 milliseconds every time it does a hop, which which I think is limited to about 32 distinct hops in this, um, just because Zigbee actually they strongly recommend you don't go any um, any further. Than You've got yourself a self-healing mesh network, I guess, by going yes. to Zigbee. Yeah. Um, how, how does the range fit in with the degree of redundancy you need? I mean, are, are there any unique routes where if, if one node failed, you're going to lose a whole bunch of street lighting? Possibly. I mean, you know, actually, generally, I mean, you saw from the map of Southampton, generally the way the networks end up being architectured is that they're quite heavily meshed. You do occasionally see scenarios where there's like one street light on its own, quite a way out. On yeah, the if you get out into the more rural areas, then yeah, rural areas is a real issue. What, what we end up doing there actually is the ones that really are on their own, they get their own coordinator just for that street light, which is actually quite so that's connected directly to the cloud. Yeah, which is quite an expensive solution, but there's not that many of them there. And we rain uh, at 2.4 gig, which is where Zigbee runs in the UK. The power levels are quite limited in the UK, so it's 10 milliwatts. Um, so what, in real life, what yeah. sort of range does that give you? If you're in a field, you probably get a couple of hundred metres. If you're on top of a lamppost? Not a million miles, if there's nothing in the way, because we're at the same height, and we've got perfectly, effectively optimised antennas, so, it's kind of, so they call a wavelength from there, they're really good. Um, the moment you get a building in the way, it's a real big problem, but streets don't tend to be like that. You know, so of so order 100 metres? Probably more if it's open field. Yeah. Is this on the direction antennas or the direction antennas? It's a it's a quarter wavelength stuff, so it's good in, in sort of that direction, but it tends not to radiate up and down very much. Um, we we agonise quite a lot about it, it. Just it works really well in this application, just because of the way the street lights generally are at the same height. As long as you're not on um, a steep hill. Yeah. As long as you, but even then, you know, the, the, they tend to be about thirty metres apart, so yeah. it would have to be pretty <laughs> pretty steep. Right, we'll take one more. If they're designed in that way, then how does the expanding that dust bins and parking meters work? They are, they're quite close, actually, I think, is the honest answer. So, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's one thing that we need to test. I mean, realistically, the next stage of this is to do a big rollout of a test network like this somewhere to see whether these things actually turn out to be a problem. Um, what is the gain of this operation at the end? Oh, not much. Probably zero. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's just I mean it's literally a, it's a stub of wire you know it's nothing particularly fancy about it it's it's designed for cheap or just good enough for the cost you know because with four hundred thousand of them you you've got to get all the sense you can out of it. Okay, thank you, Richard.